mental illness, what is it and how is it treated? Why is so little attention paid to it when 50% of all Americans will experience a mental health challenge in their lifetime? Why is the stigma still so prevalent in our world today? These questions need answering. During the 17 and 1800s, care of a person with mental illness depended on the individual's economic status and the support offered by their families. Relatives were expected to care for the person. Many people with mental illness were hidden away or placed in workhouses or prisons. Then things began to change and more attention was paid to the individual. They were taken out of their homes and placed in a hospital type setting. Joy J., Executive Director of Mental Health America of South Carolina, has firsthand experience about one such facility, Bull Street in Columbia. In the late 1800s, South Carolina opened uh, the second only asylum, and that's exactly what it was called. It was called the South Carolina uh, Asylum. And uh, people came through this gate, they came into the asylum, um, and were admitted into the uh, first building that was ever built, the Robert Mills Building. Um, it, it was a horrible time back then. Mental illness was um, often thought of as uh, having the devil in you or having um, spirits being exercised, those kinds of things. On the lower level of the Robert Mills building was probably the worst place that folks were. But South Carolina also had um, some famous people that came in during the 1900s because they did have paid patients. Um, Marilyn Monroe's mother was one that came into the state hospital. Um, so South Carolina has a long history with the mental health. This uh, campus has been here. It's uh, over 200 years old. Uh, you can talk to almost anybody in South Carolina. They know exactly what Bull Street is. Uh, your uh, mother would say, I'm going to send you to Bull Street or you're going to be sent to Bull Street. Unfortunately for a lot of folks, when they were sent here, they, they did not go back home. A lot of folks ended up staying here for a long, long time, um, years and years. Today, almost all the treatment um, is done in community centers. We do have two hospitals in South Carolina, one here in Columbia called Bryan Psychiatric Hospital, and one in the upstate called Patrick Harris. But they are both very short-term hospitals. They, uh, people go in, they stay two or three weeks, they get you know, better, and they come out to the community. This is the Babcock building behind us, and this is the second building that was ever built. And at one point, it held almost 4,000 people. They would have three to four to a room. On the left-hand side, there would be women, and on the right-hand right side, there were men. Um, if you were really, really sick, on the ends of this building were the lockdown wards, and that's where you were locked down. It, literally, you would have three and four doors of lockdown wards where people could not escape. Um, once you got to the middles of the building, you were actually given um, a pass that you could walk out on campus. And there were some passes that were even good for downtown Columbia. Um, this building, the tower, is what's so famous in Columbia for the um, cupola. P patients actually went up there. They actually had art classes up there. As more and more people came to Bull Street, Babcock Building really did become a warehouse for folks. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of treatment in some years and the federal government did come down and um, declare that we were overcrowded and that we would have to put people in the community and that was in the early 80s. Um, so uh, Babcock is going to be torn down for the most part except for the middle of it and um, and it is a real symbol, I think, for people that have worked in the mental health field of what we never want to go back to, that we always want to um, try and strive to have people in their own communities to make it. The treatment the patient received was not intentionally inhumane. In those early years, physicians used the medical techniques and medicines provided by the research and education of the day. Behind us, we have the Chapel of Hope. And the patients on this campus actually tore down the bricks from the wall around this campus and they built this chapel. And of course, we've always talked about hope. That's the one thing that um, I think is so important in recovery is that you have hope. 
I think our biggest battle today is still the stigma that that wall represents and that the stigma is still what makes it so hard today for people to reach out and to get help. Tim Stewart realizes hope is real. He is a peer support specialist helping people with mental illnesses. Imagine this. I was full of life and going to Winthrop University and I was working to help go through school and uh, playing on their soccer team. I was an English major, uh, mm -hmm. creative writing minor, and just headed, just headed somewhere. I uh, wanted to be a sports star growing up. I was playing street football and I, I was going out for a pass and I ran smack into a park trailer. <laughs> I say that because mental illness hit me kind of like that trailer. Tim says his 20s were his darkest days. Changes hit him from nowhere. Then he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. So it was kind of a relief after trying to exist for that number of years of uh, just going from job to job of getting... It was a relief to be diagnosed. Yes. Yeah. yeah. To tell you the truth, it's been a whirlwind ever since then. <laughs> Tim got into the mental health system in Colorado and continued in the South Carolina system when he returned here because of available family support. I, I got to a point where I was like, went from just being a kind of a bystander in groups and, and stuff mm -hmm. and to actively participating. Okay. Uh, um, started from one day a week going to three days a week yeah. um, and just got more assertive and grew in confidence. I think that's the biggest, biggest work for me was building my confidence back. By March 2014, Tim had met his personal goal by becoming a certified peer support specialist working three days a week. For people like Tim, who was diagnosed with schizophrenia and others with mental illness, much progress has been made since the 1800s in the treatment facilities and treatment options. Spartanburg Regional Medical Center is a shining example of the progress that has been made. Uh, the patients that come here has to agree to treatment. Most of the patients we see are in crisis. They're a threat to self, someone else, or have some type of self-neglect. Our goal here is to stabilize the patients and connect them with uh, community resources. Uh, our top diagnoses on our adult unit is going to be uh, patients with uh, major depression, schizophrenia, and some type of mood disorder. We also have a geriatric unit, and the top diagnosis on that unit is going to be dementia with some type of psychosis or behavior disturbance. Um, the average length of stay here is on the adult side, it's about seven days, three to seven days on average. And on, on the geriatric side, it's going to be 10 to 14 days, depending on discharge disposition. Um, I like to think of it as diversional therapy, because there's times when you don't need to be thinking about your problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that when you come back to the problem, your mind is more refreshed and able to better see options that you weren't able to see before. When patients can go and be creative and socialize with others, their need for hospitalization goes way down, way down. Their self-esteem really goes up when they see their own artwork hanging on the walls. It's amazing what a difference it makes um, when they can see that other people are appreciating what they've done. You know, we do have goals group every morning where everybody sets goals for the day. They also check in with us and let us know how they're feeling. We do a pain scale. We do an emotional scale of 1 to 10. How is your mood? Uh, how are you progressing? We look at that every day and we should see an improvement as each day goes by. And we really push the patients to be an integral part of their treatment plan. We do have treatment team that meets twice a week um, where the patient comes in as well as the therapist, the nurse, and the doctor. And we all sit together as a team to make sure we're all working towards the same goals. And we do work from a very holistic uh, point, uh, mind, body, and spirit. We need to be balanced, taking care of our creative needs, our spiritual needs with the higher power, how you see that, as well as taking care of ourselves with our diet, exercise, and then taking care of our, of our emotional states as well. So we try to encompass everything to keep, keep the patient balanced. Rehospitalization comes from non-compliance with medicine. The greatest cause of rehospitalization is non-compliance. When a patient understands that they feel good because they're taking the medicine, then we have a better outcome and they're more likely to stay on it.
It's a chemical imbalance in the brain. And our job as clinicians is to stabilize that chemical imbalance. It's the same thing with diabetes. It's an imbalance of insulin and the medications that we use stabilize that imbalance. Once you are stabilized, you get the appropriate therapy, you are productive citizens in the community. And that's our goal, is to stabilize them, send them back out to the community, and make sure they have the resources to be successful. Carolina Center for Behavioral Health is another example and offers numerous alternatives for a person suffering with mental illness. The Carolina Center for Behavioral Health is a 130-bed hospital. We serve folks from all over South Carolina as well as in Western North Carolina. And we help people who are dealing with mental health issues as well as substance abuse issues. We're an acute care hospital, and so we know that we're the first step in this process of recovery or beginning to deal with that mental illness. Uh, and so our therapists work really hard with the community to provide plans for aftercare when they leave us. Because most folks are here anywhere from a week to 10 days. Everybody sees a psychiatrist every day. We have seven psychiatrists who work full time here. Um, they see a psychiatrist every day. Each patient is involved in group therapy sessions every day uh, where they work through whatever those issues are that are, have brought them here to help them, you know, begin that process, as I said, of, of dealing with those issues. The clubhouse model of psychosocial rehabilitation demonstrates that people with mental illness can successfully live productive lives and work in the community. The clubhouse participants are called members, and restorative activities focus on their strengths and abilities, not their illness. I love New Day Clubhouse. And I pretty much couldn't have done it if I didn't know that there were other people like me. You know, back when I was ill, it seemed like another person. I seemed to look like I'm different, you know. I kind of know um, I was depressed, but I didn't know for sure what it was. Walmart, where I'm currently at, I have an awesome job. I'm the banana man. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing I like about coming here, is that I'm able to influence other people. Good. And also the fact that when I'm at my job, I can take in consideration that there are other people uh, dealing with problems that we cannot see with our own eyes. Hope Remains Youth Ranch is another example of innovative therapy. You can't lie to a horse. Melanie Watt, the founder and director, has combined her love of horses and the desire to help people with behavioral health problems. Well, I'm Melanie Watt, Executive Director of Hope Remains Youth Ranch, and what we do here is we use horses as uh, for equine therapy. It's just amazing how the horses break those walls down naturally. Mm -hmm. That just happens with the horse, and they have the in intuition to do that, and they pick up your heartbeat, and they break down those walls and build up your endorphins and help you have that complete relaxed feeling and they have two big ears, and they, even though they have one big mouth, they don't talk, <laughs> and they don't tell your secrets, and they just become your best friend, and they just help you to relax, and the kids and the adults just completely open up to them. They'll open up to them way before they do to people. The only thing they're here for is that horse <laughs> because it makes them feel very safe. Going from horses who are intuitive but do not talk Cognitive or talk therapy is used extensively at Westgate Family Therapy, as Elizabeth Martin, the executive director, explains. We serve a population here of people who are very vulnerable in our community and who oftentimes are not offered the type of treatment that they need to be offered because there is a stigma against mental illness and a lot of times people in our society don't understand that and are fearful or think that there's kind of no hope but we feel that there really is hope in treatment and we see people come to us all the time and begin therapy with us and 
through speaking with their counselor here at our facility, they find new ways of coping with the illnesses that they face and new ways of, of being in the world and interacting. And a lot of times they find relief for the suffering that they felt for so long. So we really believe in the power of treatment and in treating all people like the human being that they are and valuing their humanity despite an illness that they have been diagnosed with. Growing up in South Carolina, there is this term, they'll send you to Bull Street or um, don't act crazy or you'll end up at Bull Street. I think that it really speaks to this idea that our culture has about mental illness and what it, what it means to have a mental illness. And so I'm really happy that, that Mental Health America is doing the work that you're doing to really reduce that idea here in South Carolina and, and work to help people understand what it means to live with a mental, mental illness and that it is not a death sentence. If a person feels that there is no way out of the struggle they're facing, then that hopelessness creates a, a sense of despair and there's no reason to try anymore. Um, there's no reason to want to get better because they believe that they can't get better. And that's something that we certainly want to, to fight against and try and change that perception because we see people get, getting better and improving all the time. Carmen Thomas is an example of how far treatment has progressed. Instead of spending her days in and out of treatment facilities, she's experiencing a well-rounded life. She was not content with the path her life was taking. She took action. So when I was about 19 or 20 years old, I had my second job, and it was in a retail shop. And I started noticing that I did not have actually the courage to go into work every day. I was nervous uh, about seeing the customers every day. I was um, just no, no desire to get out of the bed. And this had been coming on gradually and I didn't really take any of it into account. And then I started realizing it was affecting my life and my job and I wasn't gonna be able to hold down a job if you can't go in. And um, started talking to my mom about it and she said, you know, depression runs in our family. Another big factor for me to check it out was that I couldn't even get myself into college. I could not get the courage up to walk into the steps of admissions to put myself in school. I said, you know what, I'm not going to let this run my life. I talked with my mom. We figured out that she had, in previous years, gone to vocational rehabilitation. I went into vocational rehabilitation and met a counselor, told him my situation. I didn't know what it was called or considered. I just said, I have trouble sleeping. I'm really emotional. I can't go. I, I think what really got them was the fact that I wanted to go to college but could not muster the courage to put my, my first step onto the college grounds. We started building rapport. We started trying different medicines on me. And this was all new. I've never taken medications. but. Um, first couple of tries didn't work, you know, the medicines have to be tested, you know, and it was a hard struggle. I didn't want to take medication, didn't want to, it was a lot of just having to understand you have this and you're going to have to deal with it. It's not a bad thing because if it weren't for the help that I received and the push that I have in myself, I would not be where I'm at, which is I have a, a college education and I'm now an art director in a pretty prominent firm in downtown Spartanburg. I'm well connected in the community. I'm not afraid of people. I have friends now. I have everything I could have ever wanted that I didn't have in high school. So I'm very, very happy. And it's, it's all to just being dedicated and taking care of yourself. And I'm seen regularly by my family doctor and life is good. At nearly 40, life is good. Most of us assume that mental illness is something that only affects others and believe it will have no effect on our family or friends. Truth is, mental health problems are more common than heart disease, lung disease, and cancer combined. 
Mental illness is a disease of the brain, just like diabetes, heart disease, and other physical disorders. There are no boundaries with mental illness, no socioeconomic, cultural, racial, age, or gender differences. Mental health issues affect all of society in some way, shape, or form. It is estimated that one in five Americans will experience a diagnosable mental illness in any given year. It is therefore extremely likely that you will encounter someone in your family, workplace, school, church, or community who lives with a diagnosed mental illness. Through the years, the stigma has been reduced somewhat from locking patients in an insane asylum to community-based treatment. The stigma, however, still remains, and the awareness of mental health issues is somewhat lacking. Our hope is to reduce the stigma so often associated with behavioral health issues and mental disorders. How can we do that? We need to begin the conversation, help bring awareness to mental illness as real and treatable. Everyone knows someone who is suffering. Let us all be less judgmental and bring the difficult conversation out in the open. Encourage people to seek help. Reduce the stigma and increase awareness by talking. There is hope.